All right, good afternoon, everybody. Are you having a good time here in Tianjin this year? Let's give them, let's give the WEF people a big hand. Yeah, they're doing a really great job. I'm sure a lot of you have been to a lot of these panels, and they're very interesting, very colorful, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of variety in them. We're going to offer you a little bit, a bit of a different experience today because you're all going to be on TV, okay? We're going to do our discussion, but we're actually going to edit it and rebroadcast it on CNBC Asia the uh, following weekend. And if you're interested, you can tune in and find out when you can see yourself. Maybe we'll do some close-ups of you like they do at uh, sporting events and game shows and that sort of thing. Uh, how many of you have been part of a uh, TV uh, audience before have maybe half of you yeah quite a few of you very experienced a lot of you haven't so I'm just going to give you a 30 second primer here we need your uh, we need your help to sort of make it really really uh, organized tidy and look really neat on television okay so um, it's going to be an hour program and it'll have three breaks so we'll do like a few 15 minutes take a break 15 minutes more like 13 but whatever and then do a final segment uh, on the program before we wrap it up so each break what I do uh, to get some ad advertisements or uh, promos in is we kind of uh, end of the discussion, and then I'll turn to you, and I'll go, we'll be right back with more of this great program from Tianjin. And when you hear me do something like that and go kind of nuts, then that's when you need to clap, okay? <laughs> because on the, on the TV, they pull out, and they see all of you going, hey, like that, like the price is right, okay? So we're going to practice that just once here, okay? So just a reminder, okay? Okay, so here we go. You're wrong, you're right, you're wrong, you're right. Okay, we'll be right back on that note with more of our forum, the CNBC debate from Tianjin in a moment. Bam. Yeah, that, okay? All right. Great crowd here. And when we come back, you know, from the break, there should be, I think there might be, there may be not, there may not be any music, so somebody's going to clap, okay? A CNBC person. And then when they start clapping, then help me out and join in. Otherwise, you're all going to be in an audience, and you're going to hear one person going, and that's really, really lame, okay? Okay, little housekeeping item, and I'm saying this to keep you from embarrassing yourselves. Keep your phones off, okay? And don't use them during the show because the cameras kind of pan this way and pan that way. And in past years, we've had people actually stand up while we're talking on a, you know, on a, on a pullback shot, and they're going, standing up going, whoo like that, taking pictures. And believe me, you don't want to be that person who's uh, in that picture, okay? So if you can behave yourselves for just an hour, it'll go by very, very quickly, okay? All right, we're going to roll some tape, as we say in TV, even though we haven't used tape for 15 years. We're going to introduce our topic and our panelists, and we're going to jump right into it, okay? Enjoy yourselves. Call them the re-emerging markets. Just over a year ago, the Federal Reserve's taper tantrum and concerns of a slowdown in China pushed investors to exit emerging markets. Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and Turkey were dubbed the Fragile Five. But these economies took heed to implement reforms, and confidence has since returned. Positive sentiment in the global markets has also helped. But just how sustainable is this rebound? Over the next hour, we discuss and debate the prospects of these re-emerging markets with our panel of experts. Arkady Diverkovich, Deputy Prime Minister of Russia. Ashraf Selman, Egyptian Investment Minister. Zhu Min, Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Harvard University Professor Kenneth Rogoff and Victor Chu, Chairman and CEO of China-focused private equity firm First Eastern Investment Group. This is the CNBC Debate, Re-Emerging Markets, with your host, Bernie Lowe. And welcome to the CNBC Debate on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum, Summer Davos 2014, here in Tianjin, China. I heard something in that introduction. I heard Russia. I think, I'm pretty sure Russia's been in the news for some reason. I can't quite place it, but I'm sure they've been in the news. So why don't we start there and then take a journey through the emerging markets. Deputy Prime Minister, welcome to the forum and welcome to the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Your, your portfolio, your job is to manage and guide the economy, right? Oil, the real gas policy, the real economy, yeah. But with a boss like Mr. Putin kind of changing his mind all the time, he's like making your life really difficult, isn't he? 
Uh, yes, life uh, is much more difficult than before, uh, but I'm sure the news were about Olympic Games in Sochi. Mm. Uh, and uh, those were the great Olympic Games, I think, in, in, <clears throat> in February this year. But now life is more difficult uh, uh, as external environment uh, is not really good for uh, economic development. <clears throat> and uh, what is happening now is that uh, uh, after uh, the situation in Ukraine uh, got into real mess, sanctions have, have been introduced uh, without any ground, but have been introduced by uh, United States and uh, European countries. Uh, those sanctions work as a counterproductive uh, mean uh, to achieve some results. We don't know which results, since sanctions cannot produce any results. Uh, but what, uh, what happens, uh, the harm is being done to European economy, to global economy, and to Russian economy as a part of global economy. Uh, and uh, that creates huge challenges for us. Mm. Uh, challenges to uh, find new, more reliable partners than we have in Europe and uh, United States. Challenges to uh, find uh, uh, technologies that we uh, need to uh, have sustainable uh, investment process mm -hmm. and sustainable growth rates. But most importantly, the challenge is to stabilize the station uh, at our borders uh, and to uh, stop uh, violence, uh, stop fire, uh, and uh, get back to normal. You say, uh, you say uh, more reliable partners. I think you added an S because essentially you're talking about China. Everybody else was reliable until this all, until, until this all came to blows. Well, partners that uh, stop uh, even coming to uh, Russia after uh, some people from some administration call them uh, uh, not to go, well, it's difficult to call them uh, uh, reliable, right. uh, unfortunately. But we are open to uh, continuing cooperation with all our friends and partners. Uh, we have an open economy with uh, uh, relatively low taxes, with low uh, import tariffs, uh, with uh, decreasing administrative barriers. Uh, we have some progress even in the uh, World Bank ratings uh, and uh, other uh, informal uh, ratings. Uh, and uh, we uh, do want our partners to work in Russia, with Russia, uh, and uh, this is the message that we are trying to bring here. Okay. Uh, I, do, I don't want to, of course, dwell too much on politics. That's maybe for another uh, panel, another uh, debate, since we're talking about re-emerging markets. But I do just want to address this before we get right into that uh, with uh, the Minister of Investment from uh, Egypt. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, Middle East, that's another big yep. news topic these days. I mean, it must make your life much more challenging, you know, you know in, in terms of attracting investment into it Egypt is. at a time when we don't know what the new Middle East landscape is going to look like. I think we should, uh, be the Middle East, the whole Middle East should be focusing on serious reform because uh, we've seen uh, a lot of reform programs that uh, had been taking place for the past uh, 10 years, but uh, it lacks a lot of things. It lacks international standards. It lacks transparency and disclosure on the programs itself. It lacks also uh, social impacts and it lacks social measures. So I think what happens in the, in the Middle East for the past five years was due to a non-proper reform program that took place in the past 10 years. And I think the Middle East now, a lot of countries in the Middle East uh, are undertaking a serious economic reform programs uh, that has to do with uh, social impact and social measures also, which was totally neglected, neglected totally in the past. Uh, as we have seen a lot of revolution that took place in uh, Tunisia, in uh, Egypt, and in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that was due to uh, a reform that took place was not considering at all the social aspects and the social uh, uh, reform. So it is important in the Middle East to have a serious economic reform parallel with a social reform program. Uh, and uh, this is very important to be an uh, important part of the world as this area has um, uh, major consumption and uh, also it is important to be a good market for other uh, advanced parts of the world. So I think the, the key point here is transparency and disclosure and the key point also is uh, reform, uh, the, the reform of social impacts beside the economic reform. Okay and the third leg of course to all this Victor 
uh, is uh, China, and there's a reason we're here. And uh, we all, you know, heard, uh, you know, the premier yesterday talk about the challenges that lie ahead. Um, you know, their opinions about where China is going to end up run the gamut. But I think one thing we've established consensus on is that the, uh, the you know, the the, 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 go, the go crazy, you know, happy days are over. I mean, the hard work starts now in many ways. Where, where do you think, where, where is China as a consummate China insider yourself? I think there's still huge uh, potential in China. You know, the slower growth, but going for more quality recurrent growth is very consistent with Chinese policy. And I think they're really, you know, are putting steps to the, to, to the right direction. And if you look around the world, I mean, the, the scale of uh, emerging middle class uh, um, is in China is real and is huge. And if one focus on what really drives that middle class, you know, services, um, healthcare, you know, infrastructure, outbound Chinese tourists into Egypt, Russia, Europe, it, it's just now amazing. And so I think for, for investors, um, although it's second or third wave, but we are now looking at more and more uh, attractive opportunities. Okay, we've yeah. laid out some of the issues that are before us. Uh, Ken and Ben, I'm gonna leave it to you two as, uh, as economists to draw straws and decide who wants to weigh in on where we're gonna take this discussion with uh, what we've set as a, as, as a backstop so far. You wanna debate among yourselves? Well, I thought uh, for that role, I can sleep. <laughs> but let me start with uh, challenging your question, uh, the issues about re-emerging. I would say emerging market has emerged. Compared with 30 years ago, emerging market global GDP shares from roughly 28% to today 50%. In terms of their contribution to, to global growth, from roughly 22% to today, 70%. In terms of a trade, from roughly 21% to today, 50%. In terms of investments, from 26% to 65% today. So emerging market, obviously, together, is the most important economic group in the world today. And they will continue being the emerging economic strengths for the decades to come for the whole world. So I don't see why your title is re-emerging. They are on the upside. Yes, the growth is slowing down. We observe 90% emerging market growth has been slowed down and uh, almost sort of a single line of growth has slowed down. But this is very much related to the business cycle issues. Because if you see right after financial crisis, the emerging market, because they were not hit by the financial crisis, they go through the stimulus, they pick it up, so they had upside business cycles with the capital flow in, and they really overheated in different degrees. Now they are gradually on the down cycle side. Mm -hmm. But we observe they'll be working hard to sort of stabilize themselves. Mm -hmm. we, we see the situation has been improved. Right. Yeah, but obviously, okay. they're not advanced economy yet, mm -hmm. challenge remains. Right, I feel a lot more comfortable, Ken, having heard the statistics, and Min is a numbers cruncher without peer. I mean, obviously, the numbers are impressive, but why, why, do we, why do I find myself always talking daily, day in and day out, about what the Fed's gonna do, and when they're gonna finally raise rates a year out, or five quarters, what, is it my problem? Well, well first I'll say, it, it, it is a little strange that in this world where geopolitical uncertainty seems to have increased, and we've talked about Russia, the Middle East, and yet, you know, the oil price doesn't move, Ooh. it's like a dead body, and the, you know, volatility in general is very low. Uh, so, I th I th and, and yet, if people just think there's a chance that interest rates will go up in March instead of in June, that's a crisis in the markets, that's, that's a, so, so something. Mm -hmm. I, I want to start to uh, what uh, Jumin said. I mean, I don't know that it's all a business cycle. I know you've given a lot of speeches and made the points I'm about to make, but let me make them here. You know, there's been some backsliding and reform in some countries, and maybe that's part of the business cycle where things are going really well and you backtrack, but you could look at Brazil, you could look at India, you could look at Turkey, around the world. Where I would say, you know, as things got better, partly on the back of Chinese growth, bidding up commodity prices and exports, as things got better, they, you know, did more populist policies. 
that's really a deeper concern about emerging markets because they also need to re-equilibrate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's important change in what is happening uh, in emerging market society. Uh, I don't think Jim O'Neill could imagine that he introduced the BRICS uh, uh, concept that we'll have the bank of BRICS uh, uh, at some point. Uh, and I don't think anyone could imagine that. But now we do have uh, uh, BRICS uh, bank already. What, but this is just a sign. The more important thing is that uh, while uh, initially uh, emerging markets uh, were developing uh, based on their uh, relationships with uh, um, developed countries, now, more and more ties, trade and investment ties uh, in between the society, uh, within the society of emerging markets, between Russia and China, between China and Africa, Brazil and Africa, and, and, and other uh, ties like, like that. And this is what drives uh, further growth of, uh, of those countries, not just uh, relationships with developed markets. Okay, we've set the stage here, and we're going to take our first break. We'll be back in about uh, just a little less than a minute. We'll continue the chat, and we'll actually kind of bear down and make a differentiation between uh, emerging economies. But we'll try not to ask the question, are they re-emerging? Otherwise, we'll get scolded by Dr. Jew again. We'll be right back with more of the CNBC <laughs> debate. Good crowd. Very, very good. They're pros already. Look at that. Now we can book them for every TV debate. They will ask for a pay. Huh? They will ask for a pay. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Do we actually have to wait or can we? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Who wants to pick it up here? We've, uh, that was sort of a stage setter. Victor, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Okay. I'll come to you, okay? Sure. All right. <laughs> and welcome back to the CNBC debate. We're kind of trying to determine, you know, after the, uh, the hyper cycle or the mega cycle uh, in commodities uh, is over and maybe the hyper growth rates of the uh, past, maybe just that thing of the past in the annals of history, where do we head next with the EM, emerging market space? And we set the stage in the previous uh, segment uh, Victor, and we, everybody kind of weighed in. We're, you know, we, we know that emerging markets are not gone. Mm -hmm. Don't write them off. And we've actually seen that. You know, the middle, latter part of last year, market money started to sort of sweep out. They were worried about excesses forming once again. They were gone, money was gone for half a year. And then it started to trickle back, and then hence we sort of coined that term re-emerging. So where do, where, what's the next thing to watch out for? What's the next big thing that occupies your mind. I think we have to look at what are the possibilities that something big may go wrong. Now, obviously, there are the geopolitical risks, but more than that, I think we have uh, different types of social risks in different types of societies. We have the difficulty with infectious disease. I mean, the Ebola's of the world and a different strain of SARS may really, you know, um, put us back uh, many steps. But these are things which are not really think through, and I don't think. Um, globally, we're ready for another major attack of a, of a serious strain of SARS. And we also, I think, need to work aggressively on the governance of bringing clin uh, clinical trials of these uh, drugs uh, much more advanced than our existing uh, timetable. Mm -hmm. And the other thing which I think my learned friend from Russia has just mentioned, um, is very interesting. Now, different blocks are now emerging within the emerging markets. I think you have China and Russia now working a lot more closer. Uh, we are now trying to bring a lot more European SMEs into Asia to take advantage of the rising middle class. I I'm trying to bring um, a lot more Chinese companies into Japan and Japanese companies into China, again, despite the uh, sometimes difficulties in the politics. But people to people, exchange, business to business, I think there's a huge opportunity still. Man, you know, what you, what you said earlier soothed a lot of people's minds, you know, about where we are in the world. You know, like you use the oil price as an example, you know, if, if geopolitics is so bad, then why are things so stable in many ways? And I started to get worried. I started to get worried when Victor was talking about we can't handle another SARS-like you know, outbreak, but then he ended on how people to people versus government to government can maybe save the way. Can you weigh in? Yeah, uh, I would say we probably want to divide the risk into two type of things. One is the tail risk, geopolitical risk, like uh, Ebola is type of risk, mm -hmm. and uh, ISIS is type of things. It's one thing. I think everybody got to be very careful to deal with that. 
Another issue is particularly for emerging markets. As I say, when the emerging markets are on the way to the advanced economic status, there's many challenges and hurdles. In the short term, it's obvious that clearly how they manage the soft landing to go smoothly and uh, on their uh, growth path. Which, a few things are very important. The first issue, rebuild the fiscal and the policy buffer. Recall 2008, the emerging market dealing well because they had a lot of buffer at that time. Mm. All the buffer is gone. I think this is the most important thing. So because of that, I think the most important challenge for emerging market is don't overuse monetary policy or fiscal policy on stimulating sides. Because we forecast the global emerging market growth for this year is roughly 4.6%, which is very much close to its potential growth rates. So you want to push the growth, the sustainabilities, you need to do the supply side. You need the structural reforms. If you overuse the demand side policies, you will run into another hard landing. I think this is very important. Obviously, one concern for the emerging market in their mind is how Fed access to the non-conventional monetary policy. There are few things, how Fed operates is this, how market responds to it, because the repress issues, liquidity issues, interest volatility issues. But the key issue for emerging markets is still you have to build a macro buffer to prepare yourself for the things to come. I think those are the most important things. Mm -hmm. Ken, who has, who's got the mix perfect in terms of you know, being an ace in the hole when it comes to structural and using fiscal policy with prudence and responsibility? Is there a poster child? An if I give an answer to that, I will curse that country to have a financial crisis the next year. So, I mean, it's, I think coming out of the uh, financial crisis, there are very few countries that really are in a balance because many of the advanced countries have very uh, low, super low interest rates. And it's absolutely true that now in some of the emerging markets, inflation's actually gotten way above what they're aiming for. That's a big trend movement in emerging markets because they stimulated, were reluctant to, to, to pull it out. So uh, give me a little longer and maybe I'll think of, you know, some Pacific Island country that's got it quite right. But this is a, sort of a tough moment. <laughs> Nobody's talking about, you know, having the golden touch at the moment. Nobody's talking about that. You know, you just raised a word that nobody, it's not in vogue, it's not in fashion to talk about anymore. And that's inflation. I mean, if it was, you wouldn't have central banks, you know, throwing money around like there was no tomorrow. Minister, I think you're, you, 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 you're fidgeting. You, 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 must be, you must have something to weigh in on, on this issue. Here. No, no, I mean, and inflation I, is with I, us, actually. I agree it? with him totally, but the Middle East has an inflation problem, and managing inflation is something scary in the reform programs of these countries. And I think most of the Middle East countries now hitting a double-digit inflation figure. Which, is, which means that uh, we are acting on a negative interest rate all the time. So it is something that hinder growth and hinder definitely the reform program. Uh, and I think th that's why a lot of people now, uh, especially the, the advanced economy and the big economies like the states, China and uh, big economies in the Far East are looking and focusing on Africa a lot because the coming development phase is Africa because uh, people are trying to help Africa in, in, in a mode of development in order to have a big market there, in order to have... These are more of pre-emerging markets, mm -hmm. and they need that just a push to be other markets to absorb more products and to absorb more services from the big economies. So I, I totally agree that inflation is uh, a cornerstone that uh, should, should be managed very proper within these reforms of the Middle East nowadays. Right. Victor, is uh, inflation something that can uh, really come back, come up on our, you know, behind us and catch us well, unaware? I, th I think the longer uh, the QE stays, obviously, mm -hmm. the biggest the risk down the road. I think um, the difficulty is now the, um, the re-emergence is still quite uh, fragile. Um, in, 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 in many parts of the world, you can't really take QE away quickly. But I, 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 am, I am worried. But I, I think the, you know, the other risk we are really talking about is, is regional conflicts too. I think you know, when, when one travels around the region, the emerging markets, it seems to me that the leaders are very much aware of the kind of challenges and the policy uh, uh, initiative they need to implement. 
I mean, but they can only do it in a backdrop of peace, stability, and, and prosperity. And I think that is something which is lacking in the near-term horizon. We can't see for sure an investor that, you know, five years down, um, there's, there's not going to be any trouble. I just you want know. to make a facetious comment apropos of that. You feel like in Europe they can only do a policy if there's a crisis instead of if it's calm. <laughs> but, but not with conf Well. I'm talking about you know, mili I, military conflict. No, I know. I, yeah. I, I'm looking at the contrast yeah. with uh, yeah. Yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> One of the things that dominate uh, the international policy now is the prevalence of domestic policy interests. As European government, uh, US government now, uh, any government uh, is looking at uh, its own society and is thinking about elections. And unfortunately, uh, that creates uh, uh, a negative environment for international politics and for international agreements at this point, mm -hmm. at least this, uh, this year. Uh, and we hope that uh, uh, politicians can be more responsible around the world and uh, look also at the ways to create more stable international environment. Mm -hmm. uh, in turn, this will have a positive effect on the domestic environment, but not vice versa. Are you, you're, you're fantasizing. No. You're t I'm, completely I'm, fantasizing. I'm, I'm, there's, I'm, no, I'm, there's no government in the world that is going to ignore elections and do what's really right for the country because but people they want to stay in power. But people should understand that uh, if they will uh, not have good external environment, uh, uh, then uh, they will not achieve uh, domestic, uh, uh, domestic results, positive domestic results. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes people forget about this. I, I think uh, many of our governments made mistakes in international politics. The United States, I think, made mistakes in, in the Middle East, uh, creating chaos uh, in countries like Egypt or Libya or Syria is not a good way to, um, uh, to establish uh, uh, democracy and good economic environment uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, we can count mistakes from all the sides. Uh, I'm not excluding um, our country as well. Maybe we also made some mistakes. But uh, uh, again, this is about uh, uh, prioritizing uh, international stability over short-term uh, domestic uh, policy interests. Mm -hmm. Minister, you're nodding there. Your, your country's in a very, very tough role. You know, it's a yeah. 90 million people, and you're always being asked to broker peace agreements and sort of be a a go-between, sort of a, a middle person. And you've got problems of your own. I mean, why should you have to deal yes, with that? Sure. Uh, but we, we have conducted actually a serious reform program uh, since the last revolution on uh, 30th of June. And I think uh, people started to understand that there is no way out to be isolated from the international market. Mm -hmm. People started to believe that uh, if they want uh, to improve quality of life and if they want to decrease poverty, and if they want to work on uh, unemployment rates, which is now hitting 14% in Egypt, which is very high for the first time, people started to understand that we have to be part of the global economy. And I think with, uh, by the new president elected <coughs> soon, three months ago, they started to have uh, some sort of dream that uh, reform is a must, and they started to join hands. And we have example, a uh, very good example of that, financing the new Swiss Canal corridor by local money from Egyptian saving. Mm -hmm. So that was a good example of joining hands uh, uh, to see reform and to see higher quality of life. And I think uh, the coming area in the coming period in Egypt will be more stable and will be uh, uh, targeting more uh, 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 reform and uh, better quality of life. Okay, Minister, thank you for that. On that note, take another break. Be back very, very quickly. We're going to uh, really uh, bring it down to the people level when we come across. We talk a lot about structural reforms as if it's some sort of a, you know, sort of an ether or a uh, conceptual thing uh, that's floating out there in cyberspace. But it is very, very real. We're going to talk about empowering people and actually encouraging domestic consumption and balancing economies when the CNBC debate continues right after this. Hey, halfway there. Let's talk about like approachable things next, okay? We'll do the uh, consumption sort of, we'll, we'll, we'll translate structure, uh, structural reform into Absolutely. actual models and, or, you know, something Physical approachable. Okay. okay.
By the way, are you all enjoying this? Are you learning something? I hope so. Huh? Don't everybody speak at once? Huh? Okay. All right. We good? Okay. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, one of the uh, sort of the uh, subjects or subtopics that we uh, we were tasked with addressing uh, today is, and we talked we've talked about it in some, some, in sort of overarching academic terms, but that is. Um, how do you boost the ability of people to participate in the economy? How do you enfranchise you know, people who might be disenfranchised or haven't really boarded uh, the train yet? Let's take that up and sort of bring it to the people level. We haven't heard from our two economists in a little while, uh, particularly uh, Min. Min, you, you, know, you gave the numbers, which make it sound like the emerging markets on a statistical basis they should be just jumping in piles of cash right now, but the, peop you know, the bulk of the people aren't there yet. So how, how can we do it? Well, I think you raised the very important issues on the people level. So the first issue is the job. I think the unemployment rate in average in the emerging market is still way high, mm -hmm. in the, particularly in, in quite a few countries, in Latin Americans you know, or others. So create a job for the people is still the most important issue. But then you come to uh, the reform on the pension systems, on the labor market issues, on the health care, on the education systems to enable people to find a job. I think those are also important issues. But things you talk about, people talk about sort of uh, money and the wealth, uh, income distribution obviously is another most important issues. Because in the past to grow, an income inequality is really the major killer for the emerging market move way ahead to the advanced economy. Mm -hmm. So have the proper policy ensure the growth, the fruit of economic activity be shared by all the peoples. I think that this is the most important policy and the big lessons we've ever learned in the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. What's that model? What's well, that model, Professor? I mean, what is, what, 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 we, we, we're guessing, we're human beings, you know, and we, nobody's ever gotten it right. Well, I mean, I'd say a couple things. First of all, in the broad picture, if we looked at it as a world as opposed to individual countries, this has been a fantastic period for having uh, inequality reduced. There are hundreds of millions of people in Russia and India who've come out of poverty. And so I think, you know, it's within countries that it's not as true. And part of that's from globalization, that if you're in Europe, it is just not easy because the Asians are doing very well. They work very hard. They don't have, you know, the short work weeks in some of the European countries. So that's that's certainly uh, that's certainly a, a factor that, that overstates it. I, I I don't think in the rich countries there's much way around having some change in the income tax system, some change in the tax system to uh, try to try to put things on track. Right. Do we? Tax policy obviously helps. For example, the VAT, right. which is heavily laid on the ordinary people mm -hmm. because the consumer pay more and the poor people obviously spend more money on the food, on the daily living things, so they pay more tax. Mm -hmm. So aggressively, uh, aggressive income uh, tax obviously will help on, on those issues. And expenditure fiscal policy is also important. The money spent on you know, helping the poor people to get the education, to get them on the job, or training, education, medical, all those things help, helps a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think that the macro policy do help on, on the, this incoming in distribution issues as well. Mm -hmm. Minister, yeah, please, I just want to just please weigh in. We don't hear, we don't even talk these days about, you know, what the plight, the, the role of the Russian people, the plight of the Russian people, or in terms of domestic policy, empowering the people is because, you know, the the media and the news is dominated by external right. factors. It must, it must bother you. It must be quite disturbing, well, I, disappointing I, I think, in many I think ways. There are, uh, simple and standard uh, answers to, uh, to that question. Uh, if you want to empower people, you need to have lower taxes, not substituting VAT with uh, progressive income tax, but to have lower taxes and lower government spending. You should leave uh, more money to people and let them decide what to do with their, with their own money, how to save for pensions, how to insure themselves uh, uh, in terms of medical insurance uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, what you need to spend on is education if you want to empower people. Uh, 
uh, and uh, education um, uh, that uh, spans uh, during the whole life cycle, not just uh, uh, what, 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 not just one shot all, education. All ages need education. Exactly. And uh, uh, if you want to empower people, uh, uh, you should uh, 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 create facilities where uh, people uh, choose what to do rather than decide for people. So the conceptual answer is to move from paternalistic society with high government intervention into uh, people's decision making to uh, a society where people decide more what to do rather than government decide uh, you, you, for you themselves. And, and this is what we are trying to do in Russia. It's difficult. Right. It's, uh, uh, we are always thinking about risks, uh, what uh, will happen during the transition period from the current model to the uh, better. Mm -hmm. model. Transition period is the most difficult uh, period since uh, there are some downside uh, uh, risks in any transformation, any structural transformation. But uh, in, uh, we do have uniform income tax, for instance, 13% income tax. And we believe uh, it's good for uh, job creation, to create incentives for people to work more, not to be afraid that uh, extra income will be uh, taken by the state. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, we believe that this um, decision brought very positive results for the Russian economy. Are you, are you Tea Party or a Republican? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Russian. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> you, you know Paul Ryan quite well, don't you? Huh? <laughs> Fascinating. What, what he he, fo he follows our suits. Uh, uh -huh. not, uh, it's not like we follow his suit. Uh -huh. He follows our suits. Yeah, there, that's a nice tax rate. Can I move there? Do you do you accept? Yeah, do you, sure. Do you accept yeah. immigration? Yeah. Uh -huh. Men? Yes. Sounds like a model. I mean, at least on paper, doesn't it? Huh? Like that, that kind of a tax rate, that kind of a burden on people should work. Yeah. If you believe in that. They, they, they the do capitalist have tool. Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, practically meaningful fiscal and monetary policy uh, and to help people as well. So I think we, we do see all the country, all these cases in the various uh, countries as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Minister, how do you? Your country has gone through so much. I mean, the uprising has created legions more that are technically classified as poverty. You know, with the new president, you know, with the new leader, hopefully things will will turn around. But I mean, it's lurching in so many different directions in such a short in, sh in, in such a short time frame. I think before uh, I focus on on the country itself, uh, I just want to highlight on the emerging market structural adjustments and the structural reforms. It has to do more uh, than tax uh, reform. Uh, subsidy in the, in the budget of uh, the emerging market is a major component. And I think this is eliminating the competitive advantage of uh, uh, competing in the international market. And uh, I think it is time for a serious reform in such a matter. It is time to, to start removing subsidy in a way that does not affect social uh, public. But, to, but emerging markets should act very serious on subsidy. Mm -hmm. It is a very important part of the structural uh, reform. Uh, going back to Egypt itself, we've undertaken now a structural adjustment program and a tax reform program. Uh, our tax rate was unified 20% and we increased the tax rate to 25% progressively to 30% maximum. And I think also we've, we've done um, uh, reform on the area of real estate tax and also in the value added tax, which is important to increase uh, the, the budget resources. On the other side, we've been touching the subsidy and we've removed 40% of the subsidy uh, of oil and, uh, and the natural gas mm -hmm. because we need to reflect the real prices uh, in the market and uh, by reflecting the real prices, we'll be able to give uh, 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 the industry itself uh, the market uh, liberalized mechanisms in order to face and compete internationally and locally. Mm -hmm. So I think also for emerging market, not only tax reform is uh, part of the budget uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the fiscal consolidation, but it is uh, subsidy is a major component also in the physical consolidation of the emerging markets. Right. Victor, you know, we, when, when, whenever we talk about China, we always talk from macro, right, like government led on down. But in terms of how the people are faring, you know, I mean, the statistics might belie what's actually happening in the country. As somebody with, you know, uh, you know, fingers in so many different pies, with, you know, property investment, uh, you know, transport, the whole consumer theme, are things I mean, do they need to work on that side a little bit? Yeah, I think 
Um, what makes a society successful really depends on the context of that particular society. I think China is moving really in the right direction because now the buzzword is uh, you know, try to battle uh, inequality and the you know, anti-corruption campaign is all part and parcel of that. I think the, uh, um, I look at some studies in America that if we just look at income level alone, is really we're missing the point. If tomorrow um, income doubles in America, I mean the, the happiness of society have no change at all because of the inequality, you know. Um, there's a correlation between uh, inequality and, and public health, for example, right? So if you just have income going up, but the gaps are still there, it doesn't help with the general happiness. So I think there are many stakeholders in this. Different society in China, we're moving from a lower income to hopefully a middle income. And I think the infrastructure, helping the rural to come to urban area, but also building safety nets nationwide, that's very important. Right. In a high income society like Hong Kong and Singapore, obviously the culture of philanthropy um, and the private sector willing to chip in is, is very important. But most importantly, I think participatory politics is important in whatever form, all right? I mean, different society manifests different challenges. Mm. But that's very important. People need to feel that they are participating in the whole, whole game. Okay. Oh. On that note, uh, another quick break, and we'll come back and we'll get some final thoughts from all our participants as the great CNBC debate uh, winds up after this. We'll be right back. Okay, bear with us, folks. We uh, have some audio issues which we need to sort out here. Did you say something wrong, Ken? <laughs> I know as soon as I started saying that income inequality is not necessarily rising worldwide, my mic shut off, which I must be, you know, vestiges of being at Harvard uh, that uh, I wasn't politically correct. <laughs> Okay, welcome back. This is the final segment of the uh, CNBC debate here at the uh, World Economic Forum. And we've, some of the things we've broached today and some of the discussion topics, I mean, seemingly a little bit academic, but you know, we, we agree that you know, there's no perfect example, no poster kid or child or whatever. There's no, you know, people are people, governments are governments. So we talked about structural reforms versus central banks, uh, bank policies, uh, you know, the, the politics of it all, as long as we're around, they're always going to be with us. And then we veered toward uh, domestic consumption and enabling people. And I thought it was quite interesting, um, Min, that a word which at the beginning of the year seemed to be the buzzword, because I remember the World Economic Forum in Davos at the start of the year in the winter, and so many people said inequality is going to be a very defining factor. And talking point this year, and here we are, you know, getting into the fourth quarter of the year, and it's still an issue. But then again, we never thought things would be fixed in nine months, did we, doctor? Well, inequality is a serious issue, not only for the advanced economy, but also for emerging market, uh, particularly, and uh, is a concern. And, uh, and I would say fighting for inequality probably is a much more tougher battle to fight for growth. And, or even for fighting for poverty alleviation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if you move into the, the way on the market driven the economy, right, the market creates inequality by the market mechanism. So you do need the macro policies and you do need the things to try to ensure there's a proper distribution of things going on to come up with the market mechanism, which is a no clear model so far. I think in the different stage, in the, in, in the different countries, they try different things. For example, 
in U.S., particularly in Roseville, you know, after great, uh, uh, great uh, depressions, uh, uses all place, uh, policies to improve the inequality in a dramatic way, which paved the way for the quite long-term growth for the U.S. You know, for the quarter periods. And different countries in the different cities do need a different policy to do these things. I would say the good news is in today, particularly in emerging market, all the people understand. If you're looking for the Latin American case, why we call the middle class trap? I mean, fundamental issue is a pro pro productivity issue, but in the political issue is the income inequality issue, right? The stunning thing we found is in the Latin American countries today, the per capita GDP ratio in terms of a U.S. per capita GDP ratio is a bit lower their share in terms of U.S. per capita GDP ratio 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So in 50 years, they had a lot of growth, they created a lot of wealth. But in terms of the catch up to the U.S. per capita GDP, they move backwards. And there are many things. Institutional capacity is a key issue. Income uh, inequality is a big issue. I think the emerging market need to particularly pay attention on those issues on the way to move ahead. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, when you say, uh, the, you, you say middle income trap, is that, a key, is, that's, is that the same concept as the as middle income gap or the you know suggestion that you know super growth is slowing down so dramatically that you have a big proportion of society that can't even make it into 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 middle income I mean that's been debated in in, in the China context right professor yeah, I, I mean it's sort of famously when countries reach a level of eight or ten thousand level mm -hmm. per capita mm -hmm. so they look like they're going to take over the world even if they're small, they look like they're going to do really well. Very few countries come out of that. And China's, you know, moving towards it. And it's a question. And some of the things you see in China, which can be a problem, you know, you get in pollution, for example, you get increasing urbanization, political changes. And also, just as you get richer, the simpler things you've done and you have to do other things. So it's, it's a big question mark whether China can, you know, go past that. Uh, the, the Chinese government over the past 30 years has just been amazing in managing the economy. Every time it looks impossible, they manage to do it. But the, I mean, the challenges are just stunning, especially right now when things really do need to slow down. The growth needs to come down from where it was. Pollution needs to come down. Credit growth needs to come down. Electricity consumption needs to come down. Everything. It's not easy to manage that. Very few countries have done that smoothly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Victor, mm -hmm. since we're right in the, you I know. I knew you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Does everything need to slow down at the same time? I, I think, um, I agree that China has a great potential, but the challenges are immense, right? I think the, we are seeing a case where the leadership is uh, consolidating their, their ability to deliver, right? And once they reach that decision, there's a huge potential if it get it right. And in the last 30 years, the track record has been very impressive. If with the ability to execute, they can take China to a next stage. Mm -hmm. Now, that includes many things we talk about, you know, structure, but also uh, maybe social and political changes, you know, which fits into Chinese own characteristics. You know, China may not have to go the same way as uh, Russia or America. China may have to find the way that, that it suits China. Mm -hmm. But there has to be changes that take us to another leapfrog. Now, my short answer if, is that my, my, I'm very cautiously optimistic that at least some parts of China will get to that from the lower income to mid, middle income to high income. Um, now, China, uh, whether it's lucky or unfortunate, we have first, second, and third worlds combined in one. So some part of the country will, will, will get there faster. But we, we are seeing today a huge opportunity that, that lies ahead in the next 10 years if the leadership stay the course with the political will to get it right. Right. Minister? Well, first, I think that uh, <clears throat> eliminating poverty is more important than uh, eliminating inequality <clears throat> than uh, fighting uh, inequality. Uh, and the second uh, thing, and I think it's, uh, it's a more universal answer, uh, we need to support technological development, technological breakthroughs that uh, make uh, 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 things uh, cheaper and more accessible to uh, people 
like uh, mob mobile telecommunications and internet uh, made uh, uh, think much more accessible to people. Information is uh, now universal goods that uh, can be used by uh, almost uh, anyone. Mm -hmm. And the role of the government is to make sure that technologies are being disseminated uh, around the world and within the countries. Like we are trying to provide uh, uh, access to broadband internet uh, across Russia as a whole, not just in Moscow and uh, St. Petersburg. Right. Uh, and uh, I think um, it's, it's true around the world. Uh, uh, governments should work on uh, make, making sure that uh, goods and services are accessible to people uh, independent uh, or almost independent on the income level. At least those things that are basic, mm -hmm. like health, uh, primary education, information, uh, not saying about water, electricity, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, by doing that, uh, I think we can uh, bring uh, uh, countries as a whole to the next level. Mm -hmm. And Minister, uh, in Egypt. I agree with totally. Uh, working on, on poverty is uh, much more important because we've seen that the level of poverty anywhere, especially in the emerging market, mm -hmm. is becoming very high. And uh, uh, most of the government that uh, are working on the reform programs do not really put such measure into consideration unless they have a very high figure. And then when we have a crisis, we start to think about quality and then we start to think about upheaving and improving uh, the level of poverty. And I think poverty is a big threat specifically in Africa and some of the emerging market. It is a big threat for other revolutions in the, in the area and it is big spread, uh, also risk for uh, governments to manage uh, the economy and uh, to go through a reform program properly. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually talking about the same thing, aren't we? When you talk about technological innovation and enabling people to you know, enjoy what is in the world and not go without, we're actually talking about poverty alleviation of the same thing. Correct. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, and again, that's a universal way to do that. Uh, we, we all need to uh, stimulate innovations to uh, get the world out of uh, poverty. Uh, we have no other choice. Uh, and uh, this is a real priority, education, science education and innovation. And uh, going this way, we can uh, do much more than redist uh, uh, redistributing income that is already created by somebody else. Right. Yeah, I think you, you raise the absolutely important issues. I think that all the emerging market beyond China, beyond the Russia, beyond the Egypt, have to change their growth model. I mean, the cheap labor growth model mm -hmm. no longer valid. The commodity export or model no longer valid today, right? And uh, they can still do it, but now you cannot have it on, on, on those issues as, uh, uh, as well. So for the emerging markets, it's really the key issues. So when you move the ladder, uh, you, you need to focus on the people. I think invest in the people, find the people job, make the people more innovational, and ensure the productivity of the people increase constantly. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the key models to move forward. How do you, but uh, man, what you're saying there is in some, in some cases at odds with reality. You know, you know, this whole, I mean, I know it's been repeated again and again, I'll just say it one more time, but this uh, whole China equals the world's factory theme has gone away, right? Because there, you know, that we've seen a hollowing out of the lowest end of manufacturing. The skill sets haven't kept pace. I mean, is that the people's fault? Is it, has the government given them a ample opportunity that they haven't well, taken Well, Ch China still have a ample labor force and has a huge market. But uh, moving along, obviously, you will see the further China moving the low-tech labor-intensive uh, industry out to the other country. Mm -hmm. Compared to China, have, a, have a more than 6,000 US dollar per capita GDP today with a few decades ago, roughly a few hundred. Obviously, labor cost is very different, right? You have to have a different strategies, and you have to use the uh, labor force in a very different way. Mm -hmm. I think in that sense, focus on the service sectors, uh, focus on the high-tech industries, uh, focus on more uh, technology embodied industries will fit the Chinese need better. But I, I, I would only caution that obviously every country wants to do that. They look at the globalizing world. And if actually China were hyper successful at that, and I wish it is, it would have a huge effect on the advanced countries. And a different set of people would be complaining about you know, what was happening. It's, uh, there's, there's a sense in which we live in a world which overall, uh, as Angus Deaton has said, it's better to be alive than any other time in history. And we're getting progressively richer. And it is sort of inequality and one country moving above, above the 
other. I mean, clearly education is not just important for what you produce. I, I'm in the business, but we think of it for quality of life, for how people feel about themselves, and you know, sort of sort of changing notions of what productivity is. But it's. I mean, it's not necessarily so easy to have one prescription that everybody can do, because if we all do it, then it doesn't accomplish as much. Right. I'm going to uh, finish up our discussion today, uh, uh, if you don't mind, gentlemen, back with Dr. Ju, because he kind of started this going. Remember I asked, we, you know, he took issue with the theme today, and that's re-emerging markets, big question mark, you know, is it sustainable? He said, well, I, you know, that's a, that's a dumb topic, Bernie, Why, you shouldn't have chosen that in the first place. Okay, Dr. Ju, look how many people there are in the world, and we talk in a certain utopian sense about, you know, everybody doing well, focusing on services and, and all that, but ultimately, is it something of a zero-sum game? I mean, can everybody be happy at the same time, considering the fact that We've got demographics in polar opposites. We've got developed markets where the net, the end demand is strongest, getting older and older. The U.S. is an exception, I, I know that. And then the emerging markets with birth rates that are higher than what their income or wage increases can support. I don't think this is a zero-sum game. Right. I think in the past few decades, emerging market produced good quality, low-cost products, commodities for the whole world, which is lower the price, enrich people's daily life, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for the, 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 the futures, and they also have to move, so for example, they will lead the global cons consumption as well. So bring all the more aggregate demand to the whole world, which will help uh, emerging market as well. I think that you will see the dynamics between the emerging market and the advanced economy and among emerging markets themselves in the next decade to come. Okay, Dr. Ju, on that note, thank you very much for your thoughts, gentlemen. Dr. Uh, Ju Min, uh, Dr. Rogoff from Harvard, uh, Minister Ashraf Salman from uh, Egypt, thank you very much. And uh, Minister, it's Arkady, right? Arkady. Ar Arkady uh, Vorkovic. Did right. I get that right? Not too bad, right? Very good. Yeah, I had a warm-up session on, the <laughs> T on, the on TV with you today. And Victor, thank you very much for your participation. And thank you for being with us for the uh, CNBC debate. Until next time, we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, folks, for uh, being with us for the hour. Um, we are going to clear out right away. There's a 30-minute session with a very famous Weibo microblogger. I think most of you might know who uh, she is. So we ask that as many of you as possible stay put, okay? Thanks again. Mm -hmm. No, sir, thank you very much, okay? Okay, wonderful.